All right, <clears throat> we're gonna. I mean, you guys are gonna have to be quiet because my voice, for whatever reason, is leaving me. Um, <laughs> so don't talk over me when we're going. But uh, um, uh, we'll get started. All right, good. Well, good evening, everybody, um, and welcome. For those of you that will be watching us virtually, um, I'm Tom Schreier, and I have the privilege of being uh, the founding director of the Inspired Leadership Initiative here at the University of Notre Dame. It is uh, the program for those who have completed their chosen career uh, and look to return to campus for an academic year to discover, discern, and decide their next act. I want to start by welcoming our fellows who are present here in the auditorium, and of course also welcoming all of you uh, who will be joining us virtually um, as part of our Inspiring Conversation speak Speaker Series. And as many of you know, um, the theme for this year is Journey Towards Purpose. Um, we are really thrilled and humbled, actually, by the amount of interest in the program uh, that has been generated with over 1,300 participants, ranging from our ILI fellows uh, to alumni to faculty to students and friends that have registered to join us. Um, we're also excited that the community uh, represents over 34 different countries, which is wonderful. And I want to also thank our friends in the Alumni Association who have created this platform, uh, ThinkND, which is Notre Dame's online learning platform. And um, as we've done in the past, um, we've designed this program uh, to have interaction at the end. So we'll be doing a Q&A. When we do that, I'll ask once again that you wait for the microphone to come to you so that those people that are listening in have the opportunity to hear your questions. And now, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Carrie Hannon. Uh, Carrie has an amazing background. Um, uh, she's a workplace futurist and really a strategist on career transitions, entrepreneurship, personal finance, and retirement. Um, she's a very frequent TV, radio, podcast commentator, and is also very much a sought-after key keynote speaker. She is currently a senior co columnist for Yahoo Finance and an honor expert. Um, she's also been an expert co columnist, opinion writer, and regular contributor to the New York Times, Market Watch, Forbes, and uh, personal finance and entrepreneurship expert on the PBS website, nextavenue.org. So millions of viewers, readers, in fact, I understand millions of readers on every article now um, have been motivated by your really, um, and I know this from having had the pleasure of knowing you for a few years, truly a can-do, down-to-earth message. And she's brought that message not only to the writing that she does, but also to a number of on-air forums, uh, such as the Dr. Phil Show, ABC, CBS, CNBC, NBC Nightly News, NPR, Yahoo Finance, as I mentioned before, and PBS. Most importantly, though, and it's something which I think will resonate very much with the group here, is that you're, you're, you dedicate your work to doing more than just, you know, kind of providing information, but really making a difference in people's lives and to give them confidence and also give them tools, something that we try to do in the context of the Inspired Leadership Initiative here, uh, to succeed not only um, on one dimension, but personally, professionally, and financially. And that's really wonderful, and I think the con combination of the advice and also the empowerment message that you deliver is super powerful. I love the titles of your books. Um, uh, um, great Pajama Jobs, uh, the, um, <clears throat> Your Complete Guide to Working from Home, It's Never Too Old to Get Rich, The Entrepreneur's Guide to Starting a Business Midlife, and your new book, which will be emerging very shortly, right? In Control at 50 Plus. How to Succeed in a New World of Work, which will be published on April 26th of this year by McGraw-Hill. And you've been engaged with us here at, uh, ND, at Notre Dame and the Inspired Leadership Initiative for a number of years. And uh, like your good friend, uh, Chris Farrell, you've really helped uh, spread the word wonderfully about the program. So let's get this started. Well, thanks. Yeah. I'm a huge fan of the program. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really fun to be here with you, yeah. Tom. And yeah. uh, it's just a delight to be back at Notre Dame and yeah. uh, on campus. And you know, sharing all this stuff, you know, slides. I get exhausted listening to some of that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, Yahoo, you yeah. know. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's well deserved. So maybe just a little bit on, you know, what motivated you to start the new book? What is it that uh, um, you saw in the world of work and just the world generally changing that motivated you to think that, um, it's time for me to get back at it and write this next book and yeah, call it 50 plus. Uh, it's true. First of all, I love to write books. So that's just, it's just you have space to, to think when you write a book and let it breathe. But in this case, it was coming out of the pandemic. I, I mean, during the pandemic, I saw that the workplace was fundamentally changing and changed. 
that it was never going to go back the way it was. And even as the, you know, the, the whole health crisis may fade away or change, what occurred during that period of time will fundamentally change how we work. And so I thought, you know, this is the time to let's take a look at this age cohort, you know, the over 50 set, which is part of my crowd, and say, you know, what's happened here? And when we look at the whole longevity issue, the whole population issue, things, it's quite clear that, you know, with people living longer lives, with a career that's not just a linear career, there's all kinds of twists and weaves now in, in the way people work. And what we're seeing now is going to impact the younger generations because there are just not as many coming up. We used to have the pyramid, right? You know, a lot of younger people, not as many older people. Now it's like that. So it changes the way the workplace is. And I thought, okay, so what's happening here? And what do we need to pay attention to? And I looked at the five major trends that I see coming out of this period of time. Yeah, so what are those trends that you see emerging and maybe how have they changed as a result of the pandemic? Yeah, the, the interesting thing is a lot of these trends that I, not that I noticed had actually started pre-pandemic, but what happened is it's sort of the pedal to the metal. I mean, it was this mass acceleration. And so the number one thing is not gonna surprise you, it's remote work is here to stay, right? The genie's out of the bottle. I mean, it used to be you had to beg your boss to let you work at home. It was a perk and, you know, no one really trusted that you were actually working. But coming out of the pandemic, for all ages, remote work, younger workers had been asking for this because they're digital natives. They knew that they could work anywhere as long as they had a computer. But what I love about remote work, and we can dig into it more, but it's so great for people at you know over 50 because and over 60 whatever it is because it does enormous things to fight ageism right. because when you're not sitting right next to somebody who's 20 or 30 years younger than you it's a subliminal message it's not that somebody's trying to overlook you to ask to do something but when you're not right there and you're being judged on your performance and your productivity oh my goodness isn't that nice for a change <laughs> and then the third piece is a lot of people say they're going to work longer uh, than past 65 or whatever, but they don't. Right. And they retire because of a health reason usually. And if you have a mobility issue, if you have a situation where you need an office that's retrofitted or you can't commute as easily, man, if you can work remotely, this is brilliant. I mean, so I think it's really a great thing and we can go into more ways why I love remote work. Um, contract work is here to stay. That's exploded because employers figured out, oh my gosh, I don't really need to have benefits. <laughs> I can hire you in for a short uh, helicopter. This is great for older workers, actually, but mostly if you're over 65. If you're in that range over 50 where you still want benefits, you, that can be tricky, right? It, it, there's a red flag there, but if you've been, and this crowd isn't, but if you have been um, retired early, took an early retirement package or, or were laid off, it keeps your resume alive. It's a great way, the, the boom in having these opportunities to work. The third trend, entrepreneurship, yay, we love entrepreneurship, and it had started pre-pandemic. I mean, that I noticed that in my book, Never Too Old to Get Rich, the Kauffman Foundation tracks these numbers. In fact, um, studies, MIT did a big study showing that older entrepreneurs are frankly more successful than younger ones, and uh, for many reasons. Uh, but, so it had started, but since in 2021, the number of new business starts and for people over 50 starting businesses was huge leap. Um, so entrepreneurship, um, career transition. I mean, that used to be, oh my gosh, what an outlier, what a risk taker. Someone's gonna have a second act. They're gonna have an encore career. But today, career transition during the pandemic coming out of the pandemic is something that's quite common now. And again, at all ages, but a lot for the over 50 set, because I think, Tom, we had the chance to be home and think about our priorities. What do we want to be doing with our days? What, what matters to us? And so a lot of people say, you know, I think I, I, I've always wanted to go this direction. This is something that means something to me. And they figured ways to redeploy their current skill set to go over here. The, the fifth thing is education, what you, you all are doing here right now, is lifelong education used to be, oh, it's nice to learn this, isn't this nice? But now, because of the pandemic, so many, and here, luckily, you have the community of being present, but virtual learning took off. 
the ability to find great quality ways to brush up your skills, to learn things online. Ah, amazing. So that, it really sets us up for the next going forward because we need to constantly stay up, up to date. So you mentioned there doing what matters, right? And maybe just talk a little bit about it. Is there something different about what makes people love what they do at this stage in their career as compared, uh, or in their life as compared to before? And maybe just a little bit about what creates the, you have an amazing energy, right? You've had this energy, but your energy, you know, seems to be every bit as good, if not even better now than it was a few <laughs> years ago. Though, so maybe talk a little bit about what makes you love what you do. Too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure you have enough time? Yeah. <laughs> but um, I really do love what I do. And the fact is, it, it just combines so many things for me. It was, you know, one day, uh, this is a crazy story, but I'll try to say it quickly. Um, when I, I was in my early 40s and I was working at a job at USA Today where I was a columnist covering taxes and retirement, it was my dream job. I mean, without question, I had my picture up there in a column and oh my gosh, wasn't that neat? I'd be in an airplane and I'm like, that's me, you know, and nobody else noticed. <laughs> but I was so miserable and uh, I quit. I asked my dad what I should do. He said quit, so I quit. And I went out to the Navajo Reservation and I wrote a book um, about, I profiled Navajo weavers and women who had uh, one gentleman and the other were women who passed the tools down, but the kids were no longer staying on the reservation, so they weren't passing the tools down. It was a dying tradition. I interviewed Mary, who was in her 80s. She didn't speak English. I had a translator. She spoke Navajo. She lived 45 minutes down a dirt road from a paved road in a Hogan with no running water, no electricity. She raised eight to 10 kids in that, uh, eight kids. And her loom, I think, took up the whole thing. But Mary wove monumental rugs. I mean, spectacular. Yeah. I mean, they were, and she said through the translator, you ask questions nobody thinks about. And she was right, because she was pure joy. And I looked at what Mary did, and her world was so beautiful where she lived, and her craft was so beautiful. And it, as I used that word earlier, it profoundly changed me. I came back from that experience on the reservation and I never looked at work the same way again. I looked at what is it, why do we do this? What is the magic that comes from it? And so I started everything I write now. I, need, I wrote a mission statement. I want to make a difference in people's lives. So everything, every assignment I take, every opportunity I take, I think, who is it going to impact? Can I help somebody? And so when I ask people, when you ask people, I wrote a book, Love Your Job. <laughs> so one of the things I ask people is, what makes you love your job, you know? And nobody said the job itself. The truth is, maybe a handful did. Most people said it was the people they work with, that whole community right. thing we yeah. talked about, Tom. Yeah. It was uh, the opportunity to learn new things. Right. And it was the mission of the employer or the nonprofit they worked for. Right. That is what mattered to them. Right. And that, that's it. That's what, and so when I talk to people who say they're unhappy with their job, I'm like, let's sit down and think about this for a minute. Are you just yeah. bored? Is it just that you're bored? Right. That you're not learning new things? You're not reaching out to meet new people? Right. You know, all of those things. So it sounds like in the context of your time at the Navajo Reservation, which sounds like just an amazing place to go through a transition like that, yeah. you know, was there something about meaningful work that emerged for you from that? I mean, was it, is there, are there elements to what makes that work meaningful? It clearly sounds like Mary's work was super meaningful to her, yeah, to and it her. became very meaningful to you too, right? But well, Ma Mary, what are those elements? Yeah, well, yeah. Mary was just pure joy. I mean, yeah. and I had all these East Coast sensibilities like, oh, wow, yeah. you know, hmm. Yeah. But yeah. the fact is, Mary didn't see it that way. Yeah. And for her, she just exuded this this um, sense of, and you would use the word spiritual, there was right. something about Mary that right. just was, I say joy, that's what I felt when I was with her and in right. her presence. Right. And I realized that the work she did, and we use, I always say work's not a four letter word, the work she did right. was not about the money. It was right. not, because she certainly wasn't being compensated for the work that she did in a way right. that was appropriate. Right. But. That's not why she was weaving. Right. She was weaving to continue her traditions. Right. The love of the land, I mean, it, it, the love of the, the craft, all of those things, you could feel it when you were with her. And I think that's what we can bring to our work, is finding ways to grab hold of that, whether you're working for pay or not for pay. But it has got to always be, what's the, what, are, what, are, what are you aiming for? What's the feeling? Right. 
that you're aiming for. Yeah, it's very interesting you get to the feeling, right, of it. As, as, maybe at a certain stage in life, it's more about the output as opposed to how you feel when you're doing the output, right? Like when you said you had the perfect job, and you, you know, so from an external perspective, everybody saw that output as being exactly what you wanted, but you weren't feeling as good as you clearly appear to me to, uh, to yeah, feel today, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it took me years to figure out of self-analysis, nobody <laughs> helped me, that I, it just the right. anxiety of having to work in a huge newsroom right. with people all I mean, I just, it was so rattling, the yeah. whole thing, yeah. you know. So a line that uh, I know some people in this crowd are going to love that you use, uh, because we talk about this, is um, you say that we need to retire the word retire. <laughs> <laughs> and um, uh, so maybe just talk a little bit about that, um, and, and maybe a little bit about what should the new word be, right? I mean, that's a little bit of what we struggle with, right? Is, um, you know, the vernacular maybe hasn't caught up yet with people's uh, longevity and their desire to remain engaged in some way at this stage in life. Yeah, it, it's so true because the, um, the whole, when you think about the word retire, yeah. right? It's like you're stepping back, right. everything's slowing down. You're, it, it, and like, look around this room, are you kidding? You guys aren't slowing down. I mean, nobody, that, retire, it, it just gives this mental state that actually doesn't exist. So there's not a good word. I mean, our friend Chris Farrell says yeah. unretirement. Right, right. Um, he's written right. a great book about that. And, you know, uh, did you retire, Tom, at one point? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Here I am. And yeah, yeah, here you are. Yeah. So it's yeah. just, uh, you know, it's a shift. It's moving on to do something different. You're leaving the, the linear career you might have been on and taking a new direction. So, I, you know, the people goof around and say refirement. Well, I don't know if it's refirement. There's something that's got to be better than that. I don't know. I'm, I'm up for options. Anyone here? Any ideas? <laughs> you know, it's just, I, I find that um, I don't think I would ever retire because I absolutely love to write. Right. And I love to meet people. And I love to find, I'm like so curious. I'm like, what? You do that? Right. And how did you get to do that? Like when I first met you, Chris, I was like, what? What did you do? <laughs> I mean, you get so turned on by people's career path. And how did you get from A to B? And, you know, it's fun. Yeah, it, it really is fun. And I mean, you know, we were speaking a little bit about you, Chris, before, right? Sorry. I think you, like me, like everybody in this room, you know, if, if somebody said, are you retired? <laughs> My calendar doesn't look like that right now. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, there's clearly, and I love what you say about uh, marrying your uh, two is, there's a joy that comes from people that have found things that they're really passionate about, right? And that they really do. Uh, love doing, right? That and it doesn't have to be like pedal to the metal, full-time job. I mean, it doesn't have to be the way work was structured when we were younger. It's right. not like you're going up this path or you have many, most of us at this stage in life don't have the same financial demands right. that, that perhaps you had at a younger stage in your life. You've right. kind of done those big ticket things right. and you can say, all right, I'm financially nimble or I've right. made a point of making my life right. uh, financially fit. Right. So that I have options, right. and that being nimble is it, that is a real ticket. Yeah, no, it very much is. So having some structure though and some frameworks to think about this can be helpful. You have one that's called the Hover Method. Maybe just talk <laughs> a little bit about that. Hover. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone loves an acronym. <laughs> At least I do. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you know, Hover is something I kind of put together. These qualities that I feel we all need to kind of, almost anything we do in life, and I put it in the context of finding work, but honestly, it can be anything. If you have a path that you want, to, a new path you want to start, a new beginning, but the H stands for hope. And a lot of people go, oh yeah, hope, you know, but, but hope, is, hope is really special. I mean, hope is actually, hard, it's not tangible in any way. Hope is something inside of us that we are hardwired in a way to say, yeah, you know, I feel that there is a possibility that good things will emerge, that things are, there is a way, it's sort of a, a, a feeling in a way that we talked about feelings. Yeah. Optimism is the, oh, now optimism, you go, well, isn't that hope? No, it's not. Optimism is being realistic, right? I think of myself as sort of this upbeat kind of gal, but I'm actually very, realistic. I know if that things aren't always perfect, that there are setbacks. And so if in fact, um, 
you have optimism is being realistic like that, but you can build that muscle. It, it, there's a way that you can do things like, and we talk about gratitude lists, a lot of you know, self-help people say, oh, have a gratitude list. But frankly, it, it really helps build that muscle because if you take a minute each day and whether you write it down or just mentally say it to yourself, man, you know, like I was walking my dog in the rain yesterday in Washington and it was freezing cold and it was raining. And I'm telling you, it was a street on the, uh, the, there was a party on the street because there were tulips everywhere. And the tulips were like popping mad colors. And I thought, now that's pretty neat. And to me, that was a moment of feeling gratitude for the world and its beauty. And you take those moments and you, every day you remind yourself, that builds optimism. I know I'm getting, V is for value. We've got to value ourselves. Because if you don't value yourself, no one is going to value you. And I talked to you, Tom, a bit about what I do. Often people don't value words the way they used to. And you need to have that sense of value. And that is something, again, it's a muscle you can build by what you're doing here in this program, by learning new things, by exposing yourself to new people, to new ideas. That's a way you build value. And you continually do that. Enthusiasm is our E. Now, enthusiasm is just it's just fun to be enthusiastic. Right. People want to be around enthusiastic people. They want you on their team. They want to hire you to do a job. And there's no reason not to be enthusiastic because the alternative is really lousy. And I find being enthusiastic, a good way to do that, a good way to build that muscle is to get physically fit. And you don't have to run fast miles or bench, you know, lift weight, whatever it is that weightlifters do. <laughs> I walk my dog. <laughs> I walk my dog, you know, and every day, or you could swim, whatever it is, or eat with an eye on nutrition. When you're physically fit, you're like have this can do spirit. You said I have energy. I think it's because I walk that dog. And it's, you know, it definitely gives you, nobody knows what it is, but they want what you have. They're like, yeah, that, that's good. So that's, that, that's enthusiasm. And the final part of hover is resilience, which is a real buzzy word. Everyone says resilience, but resilience is something that we can build as a muscle. It's understanding, and we all do at this stage in our lives, that some things go wrong. You do have setbacks, you do have sadness, you know, you have events in your life and in your family's life, but you come through it. You emerge on the other side. And a way to rebuild or to build resilience is again, back to learning. Because when you're learning new things, you're a beginner again. You, it's like you're, and then you become educated. And so it's that, you go back and then you come back. So you, uh, this kind of gets in the context of maybe resilience, right? And you're right, it is kind of a buzzy word, but I think it's buzzy for good reasons, right, in the context of the environment that we're operating in. But are there in particular challenges for people at the, you know, in the, when you say in control at 50 plus, for those people that are 50 plus, are there challenges that require that resilience for people to overcome? And maybe what are some of those challenges that uh, are unique to that, that yeah. age set? Oh, Tom, that's an excellent question because that really gets at the issue. I think yeah. why I said in control at this stage in our life because right. I think often people feel that they reach a point, they've achieved a lot of the goals they had in life or their dreams, have, and then all of a sudden they don't know where they should go and they start relying on others to tell them who they are or what they can do and what they can't do. Right. And they, don't, they feel out of control. And often this happens to workers who have stepped out of the workplace or and then now they want to get back in. Maybe you've left for caregiving purposes or whatever it might be, but the rejection of ageism in the workplace is daunting and it's really exhausting. And there are all these things um, that we're told that we, you know, we, we're not, you know, we're not, not up to speed with technology or, you know, we don't have the energy or we don't get along with younger kids or whatever it is, they're all not true. Uh, maybe for some people they are, but not for most people. And so I think that it's getting control of these elements that sort of this image of an, like what is old? I mean, if we, if I asked all of you, what do you think old is, you know? Like old, what, what is that? And you know, when you say older worker, what? Older worker, like I think old is like a really nice antique. <laughs> but you know, but so I think it's really taking, taking owning who you are and what you are and what you have to bring to the party. 
So as part of that, Arshav, you talked about one of the elements of fitness, right? But as I read your book and I read your images, you have multiple elements to fitness at this stage. Yeah. So talk to that a little yeah, bit. Yeah, I have Carrie's Fitness Program if yeah. anyone would like to sign up. <laughs> yeah. And it's not expensive. Yeah. Um, it's not a gym membership. Yeah. It's, um, I've got, yeah. so my fitness program begins with number one. And I just told you, physical fitness. I mean, key, key, key to fighting ageism. And people would come up to me when I give talks. And I will say a lot of times it's women, but they'll be like, should I get Botox? Should I dye my hair? And I'm like, you know, like if you really want to do that, absolutely. I mean, if you're gonna, if that's gonna make you feel better, but get physically fit, right? Just do something for yourself, and that's key. The second piece, and we mentioned this briefly as well, is you have to be financially fit. So no one wants to do a budget, and that, no matter what stage you are at life, if you have a gobs of money, whatever it is, you still need to know how you spend it, and what your demands are, what people want from you, and what when you're when you're lean and mean, a lot of people at this stage in life tend to, we have these opportunities to move to parts of the country that aren't as, the cost of living is lower or to downsize. And so that frees you up so you don't have to, you have options about the kind of work you want to do if you want to volunteer or you want to work for a nonprofit. Whatever it is, when you're financially fit, like debt is the biggest dream killer, and most of you know that. But for people who are starting a business, particularly, it's, it, it really stops them cold. Right. And so that, and then my favorite piece is you have to be, the third piece of my program is to be spiritually fit. And that's going to mean something different for everyone. Um, in this context, I'm talking a lot about anytime you do change or you embark on a new path like all of you, are in this program, it's a little scary. It can be a little stressful. You're meeting new people. You're you're asking yourself to learn all kinds of new things again. And um, and and so when you're spiritual, but you have a place you can go to where there's this inner calmness. Whether it's mindful meditation, yoga. I walk my dog. But it could be lots of things that where you can just quiet things down. But you have to make it part of every day. It has to be a habit. It's not something, oh, I'll just do this. But build it into your life, whether it's religious practice, whatever it is that makes you center. And so um, you talk about that in the context of you know, what, you, what you talk to others. Maybe just, you know, you talk about walking the dog. Are there other things that you find that work for you that, uh, that fit, a, fit that fitness program uh, and have really helped you to kind of maintain the energy and all of the characteristics in the hover uh, program yeah. yourself? Yeah, but you know, I, I got to say that the number one ingredient in, in having a life that you're eager yep. to embrace is curiosity. And I don't know, I, ever since I was a little kid, I've always been curious. Yeah, yeah. And so that's why I say I love meeting new people. I love saying, like, how did you do that? Like, when I first started to work, for, I knew I loved to write, but I was like, oh my gosh, I'm like, I, how can I ever make money writing? Yeah. And I wrote my first book when I was like 10 years old, and it's not been published yet. <laughs> but I still have it in my little notebook, spiral notebook, in my desk, my office desk, and one day, It'll be published. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but what I started doing is, I, I love horses. I'm like crazy about horses. I know I was talking about my dog, but I'm a horse, a really horse crazy girl. And I would go to these events, these horse shows, and I would interview professional horse people, right. horsemen and women. And I um, found out how, how they started to do that and what they did. I'd tell their stories. Right. And I'd sell them to horse magazines, yeah. like for 75 bucks or something. It was grand. Right. And so as I moved along, I. I found that my favorite thing to do was to tell people stories yeah. and to ask them questions about their lives and why they do what they do. Right. And that turns me on. So that's where I get my, besides walking the dog and, you know, all those things. It's really, it's that, I get high off of that. Yeah. You know? Yeah, well, I, that, that whole concept of energy, right? I mean, I always tell people that I know I'm doing something I love when I walk away with more energy afterwards than I walk in, right? And I know I'm doing something I don't love when I walk, in, walk away and I'm like, oh, my gosh, you know, I'm exhausted, <laughs> right? But that's, I think, it's, it's a, you know, I think that kind of runs through everything you say, right? That it is, there's just something that, you know, in things you really enjoy where you draw energy from them continuously. Yeah. I think that's really powerful and really valuable and kind of threads through all the work you've done, right? It's, it's about that and in many one, respects. One interesting thing, Tom, people often, when we were talking about loving your job, so there are three things I, I often tell people to do if they're really, you know, sort of stuck and they, they're trying to figure out what kind of, what they want to do, what kind of work they might want to do, whether it's, again, it can be all kinds of things. It doesn't have to be full-blown. 
But I, I, I tell them, okay, let's think about this. Tell me about a job that you absolutely loved, like your first job as a kid, like where you deliver in newspapers. Like my little brother, I would say, Jackie, what did you love? What's your favorite job? And he said, I loved it when I delivered newspapers as a kid. And he said, I hated waking up early, hated that. But he said, it was so quiet. It was so quiet. And then I had this crazy school and everything, but it was so quiet in the morning. That, and to me, I, my first <laughs> real job was I sold Avon day to door, door to door, right? Yeah. Now, I'm shy. I, all right, you don't know that, but I'm really a very shy person. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was. I was super <laughs> shy when I was a kid. And uh, so I was like, this was, super, this was so hard for me. Right. But I, I w when I made a connection, when I met somebody, I'd get that feeling of, right. Uh, and I thought, oh, there's something here. So I laugh when I talk about that job, but I remember that feeling of making the human connection, and that's something that if I can find ways to tease that out and put that in my current work, and there's right. ways it's already there, right. but I, I, I don't recognize it or I haven't right. thought about it. So it, it's fun. You can think of all kinds, whether you were a waitress. I mean, there's wonderful things. Um, then the second thing is I tell them to look at their hobbies. What about your hobby tells you a clue about what you love to do? and that what you can bring to work. Right. So, I mean, that's an important thing. And then family relationships and what you do. What are some clues about what you do? Like I was talking to Tom earlier during the pandemic, I cared for my 91-year-old mom who had dementia. And it was really, I was hanging by a thread. It was, it was tough because I'm not a trained caregiver. But I learned a lot about myself in that time. I learned a lot that I had a lot of patience. I had patience and I had empathy. and. I was a patient advocate and I was a financial manager for her and I was a musical director because I sang Oklahoma so many times I can't tell you <laughs> because she absolutely loved that musical. And so it was like, oh, these are clues to what makes me love work because some of that is, I can, yeah, that does, I do have that over here. So the human connection you mentioned caused me to think about something we talked about earlier too and that is how do you see the workplace evolving, right? I mean, everybody went from, you know, kind of a more traditional in-office context to a very virtual context, but can human connections be made in the context of a virtual environment, or how do you, how do you think about that uh, in the context of, you know, people um, as we look forward over the course of the next five years? Where do you, how do you think the work environment's gonna evolve, and how important is that in-person human connection gonna be over time? Yeah, I actually do think it's, a, it's important. Yeah. I, I honestly think it is very important, and especially for younger workers, because I know that the contacts I made when I was in my 20s and 30s working in the office, these are people I'm friends with today. Right. These are people, I've built these lasting relationships, and I feel bad for the kids who, when they're onboarding at companies today, they don't have that opportunity. So right. I, th I don't think it's going away, and I, but I think there'll be more hybrid. I think employers have figured out that it's a lot less expensive to have virtual workers. Right. And so, uh, but at the same time, they lose that loyalty factor. So, right. so it's gonna be a little bit tricky, but I encourage workers all the time, even if it's a remote job, get in there when you can. If once your office is opened up, I tell people, get in there because you need to have that human connection. You can do it virtually, but it's a really, really hard. So this group here, right, has definitely come back to school, Yay. right, to, uh, <laughs> to, to make this, you know, discern transformation as we talk about. But, but uh, you know, people that they're going to be in touch with and people that you talk to regularly don't. All, that isn't always the way people kind of, you know, reposition or retrain or refocus. What are other ways that you've seen that have been successful for people that want to make a transition at this stage in life but maybe um, don't... Uh, um, you know, coming back to school isn't the right thing for yeah, them. Yeah, it's not always coming back to school. Yeah. I do think education has to be part of somehow. Right. Like if you're shifting to try something new, you're probably going to want to add some new skills. Right. And, uh, and you should, or a certificate, or whatever, because you know, there's this curiosity. Maybe I tell people who want to do something different, just take one class. Just get started and see if that interests you. Right. You think it does, but really. And then, you know, classic, volunteer, right. you know. Uh, Moonlight, Apprentice, any of, do the kind of work you think you want to do. And maybe it's not as dreamy as you thought. The other really important thing, back to that people connection, talk to people. Reach out to people who work in that industry, people who um, work in companies you admire. And this isn't this group necessarily, but you know, companies they admire or nonprofits they admire, the mission they admire. Talk to 
them and find out like how do you what do you do what's it like where are the opportunities in this area and people absolutely love to talk about their work yeah you yeah. found out right here you asked me about yeah. Mine. Yeah. I mean it, people love to talk about it. and if you're not trying to get their job they're more than happy to spend right. time with you but you've got, <laughs> you know, so you've got to do that reconnaissance I mean right. I think it's really critical yeah. and so you know it's all those things it's baby steps no rash right. moves you know, really learning what's out there. And the people who I found that, that have been super successful at making a career transition are these ones that really planned and they, it didn't happen overnight, it was a process. Right. And they were willing to shift where they thought because the unexpected happens. Right. You know, a, an invitation might come up over here and, right. and so they, they prepared and they were willing to try new ways of doing things. Well, the unexpected certainly happened to you, right, when you told me the story of how you ended up where you are, right? I mean, I don't think you would have imagined a few years ago that um, an organization that you wouldn't have even known existed because it didn't, right, a decade Except ago. Except telling people uh, not to have a Yahoo email. Right, exactly. Um, it would be a place where, you know, every article you write, you get two million readers. I mean, that's really know, quite remarkable, average, right? It's like crazy yeah, good. Right, right. Uh, it's so hilarious. And it, I was, uh, to me, all right, I'm, I'm uh, 61 years old. And I've run my own business for 20 years. I worked in-house for 20 years before that. And I tell everyone, have a great LinkedIn profile. You got it. But mostly I'm on LinkedIn because I have fun like exchanging ideas with people and promoting my friends. But then this recruiter calls me in December out of the blue. You know, they'd seen my, res my LinkedIn profile and they wanted to know if I was interested in working for Yahoo Finance. And I was like, well, okay, what are, what are we talking about here? <laughs> And you know, we want you to be a senior columnist, you can be an on-air expert. And then they talked about some other things. I said, well, that's not really what I do. So I told them what I did. And they're like, oh, well, we can just rewrite the job description. That's fine. And I was like, OK. And uh, it can be fully remote. And I mean, I'm not like really talking out of school here too much. But I mean, they offered me more money than anybody ever paid me. <laughs> and I always tell older workers, you know, be prepared. You're not going to make what you made before. And I'm like, hmm. All right, and the beauty of it, 61, I still need health insurance, right? right. And I love having an employer-provided retirement plan because I've been socking away by myself without any matching right. dollars. So all of a sudden, Tom, my whole world, I thought, well, this is interesting. And I thought, okay, should I do this? I mean, I'm pretty independent and I have a lot of autonomy. So I negotiated. I said, you know, I like to do books. I like to do speaking. That's fine, as long as you talk about your fun. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, so you all heard it a few times here. So there we go. Um, yeah. and, um, yeah. the, uh, yeah. So it's just been, it's been a really nice little ride. And, and again, I, I, um, I, in order to make this big, huge decision in my life, I said to my sister, because that's who you ask, your sister, right? Because my dad's not around anymore. So I was like, Dad, you know, I mean, Patty, what should I do? And she goes, what? What are you thinking about? If, if it doesn't work out, it's not like you're going to ruin your career. And so the whole point of saying that story to you is that you never know where an invitation is going to come from, and you got to be open to it. Because right. at this stage in life, who cares? Right. Just give it a try. Because right. it's like a patchwork quilt. You know, I might do this for a while or that, or this grows into that. Right. Well, and, and the, in, in one of the classes that we do together, um, that whole concept of trying all these different things we call prototyping, right? Just having this, uh, uh, giving yourself the opportunity to test different hypotheses about your life, right, at different stages. And, you know, it's not always the first time in uh, two decades that you get a job that you get paid more than you ever got paid kind of <laughs> hypothesis that so we're crazy. faced with. But, uh, but you know, those kind of things can happen, right? I mean, you know, um, I think, you know, Chris and I would both say if, if somebody had told us we'd be sitting in the chairs we're sitting in here, we would have said, really? <laughs> you know, my friends But you me, said yes. But we said yes, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh, it's true, right? I mean, it wouldn't have had any effect on our former lives, right? Because it's so different um, yeah. and so distinct. So I'm going to close before we open up for questions on a topic that's really important, I think, for people at this stage in life, and it's the identity question, right? Um, because identity is so tied, I think, for a lot of people in the early part of their lives to their job, their business card. So talk a little bit about the identity topic. You write about it wonderfully, so I just yeah, love to okay. have you share that with uh, Thanks, this Tom. Group. It's really, it's really so important, you know, how we identify ourselves, who, who we are. Like when people, what do you do? How many times do people say that? How, what, where do you work? What do you do? It's like, you have to have something to hold on and identify yourself. And I, I find when people step away from their primary careers, they often, there's a lot of depression, there's a lot of 
uh, you know, really grappling with who, who am I and who do I want to become. Uh, and trying to see the world through fresh eyes again is super hard. And so what you really need to take that time and often, and you all don't necessarily have to do that, but I often recommend people talk to a career coach or somebody if they want to continue working in some fashion. Uh, you know, or I even if it's volunteering, but talk to somebody who can look at you objectively and, and see, pull out those bits about you because, and this is, I don't have numbers on this, so I was, I gave a presentation a week ago at Duke University and I was, uh, my fellow speaker was a gerontologist and he said that the numbers show that, and particularly with men who retire and don't go on to doing something, lose that identity, lose who they are, their sense of meaning and purpose in life, that they, within a year, have some pretty serious health issues that crop up for them. And women, not as much. Women are a little more hardwired to have another network and another sense of identity right. beyond the workplace. Interesting. So it is, uh, that's very interesting that there is a kind of a gender distinction there. There right? is, um, yeah. yeah. That's very interesting. So why don't we do this? Why don't we open it up? Um, Emily will bring the microphone over to anybody who has questions, or Ashley, um, uh, and we'll open it up for questions. And I'm happy to talk about my dog, too, if you yeah. like. <laughs> She's very cute. Yeah. <laughs> Patrick. Well, Carrie, first, thanks for being here. And this has really been even better than I expected. Ah. So I have a question from the other side of the coin. If I'm an employer, and you're the futurist sitting with me as an employer, and I have a few hundred employees who pre pandemic, we're all working in office shoulder to shoulder. Now they're all working at home. They're starting to come back in small numbers. And I have an age group that goes from 20 to 65 or 70. Give me three good ideas on how to start that transition for the future in a way that accommodates, whether it's hybrid or whatever, and makes me an employer of choice for somebody who's 21 and someone who's 65, and again, that employer of choice opportunity that would distinguish me from the other folks who are having the same issues hiring the same people because there just aren't enough of them. Right, right. Uh, that's a super question. Uh, the number one thing, I mean, and, and uh, there, easily I can get to three, but the most important thing in today's workplace and the future workplace is flexibility. It is essential, and it is um, a focus on understanding, and I think the pandemic allowed employers to look into people's homes a lot when they were virtually working, and they realized the caregiving burdens that young families, and also like in my situation, taking care of my aging mom, they realized that caregiving is just, it goes across genders and age groups, and they've got to pay attention to caregiving, and there's not enough caregivers in, out there because they don't get paid enough. So if they can offer a, a service, like a lot of companies I've written about recently are you know, ramping up offering caregiving uh, for their employees. The Wealthy is one, is a really terrific company, that, a startup in New York. It's um, Well, W-E-L-L, -L, uh, and uh, companies hire them too. So if somebody's having trouble trying to find something to, uh, for their mom's care or their kids, they give them an access of caregivers and people they can talk to. So it becomes an, it, it almost like another benefit. So that's a benefit that employees are going to be looking for. They want flexibility in their work schedules. They want caregiving as a real benefit, a real benefit. And they want to have opportunities to, um, at any age, to work across disciplines and to work across age groups. I think younger and older workers are understanding the magic of the two coming together in a way that we didn't it didn't happen in the workplace before but if a, an employer can build that in and understanding building teams of to um, you know multi-generational teams instead of being you know really homogenized and what it is so i think those are three key things understanding the caregiving understanding flexibility and intergenerational uh things one thing i do want to note that i think is is uh interesting and I've noticed this when we all just said my example of this ridiculous job I I'm loving right now is that employers in my a employees my age who I never are getting hired like crazy right now right there are two jobs for every unemployed worker in America right now and employers 
just want to hire somebody who can do the job today. They don't want to hire somebody who's younger who's probably going to job jump on them because they've already figured out working remotely that they, they, can, they can take jobs all over the world now. So they want somebody who can step in and start and work, and they don't have to pay to train them. They don't have to get them up to speed. I think that's why I got my job. And I, 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 yeah. I could give you 12 examples like this. And so there's hope out there. for. And I see a lot. 3.2% of the workers who were retired last year, a year ago from right now, are now back in the workforce again, yeah. which is a pretty significant. That's an economist from uh, Nick Bunker, who I, I really like from Indeed, gave me that statistic this week. He said that's the most, he said it really shows that people took the time out, they paused, and then they thought about what kind of work do I want to do, and employers are open to saying, yeah, I want you. Well, you know, it's interesting you mentioned the intergenerational component. It might be something worth talking about um, over the course of the reception because I think there's an incredible intergenerational thing that happens in education, too, when you have the opportunity to do what uh, the fellows here um, are doing. Yeah. And I think that's something that's overlooked because universities never historically introduced people of our generation into kind of the core of the academy um, that is a um, higher educational institution. So just as I think employees are looking for it. Um, it's yeah. interesting. I think it's I think also it, but it's what turns us on. Yeah. Like I said, my my manager, my my editor is yeah. maybe 20 years younger than me. I haven't asked her, <laughs> but I'm telling you, I love working with her. She just is so smart, and I just I mean I get energized working with her, and she respects me in a way that I haven't felt valued in years. Wow. So it's just great. But one other uh, point when I was saying about what employers should do is this is non-negotiable now for a lot of kids particularly, is you have to be uh, doing good things for the environment and for the world. I mean, right. you, you have to have a mission. And we use, I use that word a lot. But when I was starting out in the workplace, I never once thought, well, what's, what's the mission of Forbes magazine? It never crossed my mind what anybody's mission was. I just wanted a job and go to, right. but today, young people as well as older workers want to work for, they want to have value in what that company is doing, what the right. product is, and that they're doing good things for the world and the environment. Yeah. I think that's very true. Other questions? Yes, Clementine. <laughs> Microphone's coming from that side. Yeah. Thank you for very much for how inspiring you giving us the talk. Um, you mentioned something about the word retired, retirement, <laughs> and uh, really it was like, you, you don't like the word, but it is there. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I believe when you talked is when it came to my mind that yes, the word really make people somehow uh, draw back or pull them back to in, in some way. So what do you recommend? And how do others who are coming out, actually we just call words transitioning, transforming, something like that, because we know once somebody feels like, when I'm retired, the some shyness comes, it's when you pick up, and also others look like when you retire, that you should be different. And to me, I've been seeing that, yes, actually I mention it more of the times that if I'm working today and tomorrow is my last day of work, what difference does it make in my ability to do? So then what word should we use? How should we advocate so that people do not see retirement as something drawing you back, you set back, you, you, you are not the, somebody who can be productive? Yeah, I love that. I mean, I, that I, and so another true. part is the acronym that you talked about. I've written the words. But I don't know how it comes out as um, maybe an acronym that you can just pronounce and then you feel those hope, gratitude, value, yeah. something like that. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah, thank you. That's, it's true. That the other, you know, the thing I, I was, sometimes when I talk to groups, they'll say like, well, I'm retired and I'm really happy I'm retired. And I'm like, well, of course you are. They're like, I'm just, I work so hard. And it depends, obviously, if people have like physical jobs that are really, it's exhausting and you want to, you look forward to the day where you don't have to, you know, you know, get the 815 into the city as Bachman <laughs> Toner or Robert Drugs. <laughs> but, but if you can get up and do something, I mean, I think it's, it's a period of life where you don't 
You have choice where you can, you're doing what, you're taking control. You're doing what you want to do now. This is your time. It's your me ink. You know, it's, I think of Carrie ink, it's Tom ink, whatever. Yeah. I mean, you take this, you're taking back your life and you're, oh, you're owning it. You're owning your skills, who you are. And so you're not retiring, but you're owning all of this and you're moving it over here. Right. Any other questions? Yep. Oh, it's hover. H O V E R. Hover. Yeah, like hover over. I think of it as something hovering over us. So it's H O V E R. So hope, optimism, value, enthusiasm, and resilience. You just wove gratitude through the whole thing. That's what you did. <laughs> I did. Gratitude. She was, she was to, well, I put gratitude, to <laughs> gratitude I put on optimism because yeah. I thought, because yeah. that's a way to build the, your muscle of optimism is by taking. Uh, Every day, think being grateful for things. That's a way to build that muscle of optimism because you start to see the world as like, hey, you know, there's some pretty cool things that happened today. Yep. Thank you. Hi, uh, Carrie. Thank you very much. It's been a great talk so far. Um, one, I think I heard on a um, earlier uh, conversation from one of the prior years. Um, you don't retire, you rewire, which I really like. So yeah, um, yeah. I like that one a lot. Um, so. The pandemic, you talked about how the pandemic sort of changed things and, and um, supercharged opportunities in some respects and changed what was happening in the world. Um, we've recently seen a, a, um, develop, developments in the world that have questioned whether or not the globalization trend um, is gonna continue. And um, maybe that's the next um, major trend that's going to change the way things happen in the future, but I just was wondering if you had a thought as to what's the next thing that's going to drive um, changes in the workplace after um, the pandemic? Is it, is it globalization, deglobalization? Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that? That's so intriguing. Um, I, you know what? I, I don't think you can go back on globalization in the sense that because of we have this virtual footprint and everyone's so interconnected with computers and that, that the world has become so small in that respect, I think from a business standpoint, clearly supply chains and the sense of uh, being more protective and less dependent on some of the virtues. I mean, Tom, you probably could address this more easily as a business person from that respect, but I honestly think that the globalization can't, it's not going to go away, but I think there's going to be this um, more insular feeling for companies who don't want to get stuck out in the rain, you know, if when things go haywire like they have since, uh, you know, the Ukraine situation. I think that's really kind of, uh, that we're so, again, back to the 70s. I mean, I remember those gas lines and, you know, and you start thinking, really? We're going through this again? You know, it's like, but we don't have lines and the gas prices are coming down. But, but it's, it was scary, right. you know? Yeah, and I think you touch on some of the things that, uh, um, you know, are, you know, maybe, maybe they are follow-ons from the pandemic and predicting exactly sort of what that next kind of big event is going to be that's going to be kind of transformational. But I think there's a lot of different threads you've talked about, right, that are transforming the workplace and the exact direction they go, you know, maybe altered by world events. But I uh, think the world events, but I think one of the big lessons coming out of the pandemic for all age groups is the sense that we, we had to lock down. We, we were not, we were in our little bubbles, and we really did, um, we were scared, right. right? There was fear, like, what, what is this? And it made people think about why, why we're doing this. I mean, what matters in the world? And you don't, that's, that's not something you forget. That's not something, and they, young, like my nieces and nephews are, you know, they, they have a new zest for what they want to do with their lives in a way that I've never seen um, young people have. And, and then my people, my peeps, the over 50 set are like, yeah, this is my time. I'm going to go do this because I don't know what's coming down the pike next. I don't know what might shock the world again. So I want to grab what I can now. Well, and, and th this is something that you mentioned um, just as we were sitting down before. Um, one of the questions I think that people at our age ask each other is, did you get a moment with 
either some member of your family that was more extended than you expected in the context of the pandemic, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. And for you, it was your mother. For yeah. me, it was a couple of our children. I think all of us probably have different stories. And you realize, wow, that mattered, right? It actually did <laughs> so matter. Matters. And those connections are connections we didn't have the opportunity to make to the same degree. Yeah. And so to the, whether it's, you know, it, both of those are intergenerational, right? Whether it's from, uh, you know, from late 50s, early 60s to 90, or from, you know, 50s and 60s to 20s, right? I mean, I think it did bring something there that maybe has created an appreciation that will infuse the workplace into other things. I'm, I'm so, hopeful. Yeah. You know, I, I yeah. truly am. I, I think there's a lot of, every, you know, it was a really shocking time for the whole world, but I do believe that good things come out of it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there are obviously not everything, but I do think there's some really good threads that, that will come out of it. All right, well, um, we're running out of time, actually, amazingly enough. It flew by. Um, so do you have any final words before I uh, Well, this, I, I, so this has really nothing to do with this, but I keep thinking <laughs> about my dog. So I just want to <laughs> I just want to say this one thing is I I got my puppy during the pandemic. And well, my older dog died during the pandemic, which was heartbreaking. She was 14. Uh, and anyway, so I got this puppy a couple months later. And you know, what, she, it was a lot of work. But <laughs> the thing is, I, I'm like, how did I ever do this before? But I realized I got down on the floor and I started playing again. And I, I was like, whoa, I forgot how much fun that is. You know, just don't, be stupid. Get on the floor and be stupid. Right. And then I would watch her and she'd see a butterfly and it was like, and a lot of people get this with their kids or their grandkids, their babies, but I don't have kids. Watching this puppy, look at this butterfly, I was like, wow. That's what it's like to see the world for the first time, to see something for the first time. Or water dripping from the gutter in the rain. This little, wow, she'd look at it quizzically, like, what is that? And then I thought, I gotta remember to do this. I gotta remember to do this with my life. You know, look at things with fresh eyes. Look at, uh, you know, eyes of a child or eyes of a puppy. That's what makes our life happy, I think. <laughs> Well, Carrie, it's, you know, I had mentioned before, there are people that uh, I've had the great pleasure of uh, meeting that give me great energy. And every time we talk, whether it's by the phone or for a while it was by Zoom or a couple of years ago in this person or now, you bring great energy. You just bring an amazing Thanks. energy. And I will leave with more energy than I walked in. So to me, that's a sign of, um, you know, being someone who truly is inspiring and really brings great value. So I just want to thank you so much for joining us. And I also want to uh, thank everybody that's joining us virtually. Hopefully those people that are joining us virtually have I've also had an opportunity. This is our last installment of, of inspiring conversations for this semester. Amazingly enough, this semester is wrapping up in a couple of weeks. Um, uh, but um, for those of you that are watching this and haven't had an opportunity to see Father Richard Rohr or uh, Jerome the Bus uh, Bettis or uh, George Lopez, uh, please feel free to watch those in addition to this. With that, uh, I will thank you all for joining us and uh, have a good evening. <laughs>